controversy in Greece over an arms deal to Saudi Arabia. The government of Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras is accused of failing to follow proper procedures. But how is the weapons trade regulated? And is this dispute politically motivated? This is Inside Story. Hello there and a warm welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. MPs in Greece are demanding answers about a $79 million arms deal with Saudi Arabia that's now on hold. The opposition New Democracy Party accuses Defence Minister Panos Kamenos of illegally employing a middleman to negotiate with the Saudi to negotiate the Saudi agreement. Now, Greek law stipulates that civil servants handle the terms of contracts, not government ministers. Kamenos denies any wrongdoing, but the dispute is a potential threat to the left-wing government, headed by Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. Let's go now straight to our guests. And joining us from Athens, we have Gabriel Sakalaridis. He's the director of Amnesty International Greece. In London, Andrew Smith, spokesman for Campaign Against Arms Trade. And in Stockholm, via Skype, Peter Weisman. He's a senior researcher on arms and military expenditure program at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Great to have you all with us. Gabriel, first of all, just provides a little bit of context here. Why is this deal in Greece, potentially with Saudi Arabia, so controversial? Uh, it has been controversial for various reasons. Uh, as you have uh, already mentioned, uh, one of the reasons uh, is that uh, there are some allegations from the side of uh, uh, the opposition uh, that uh, there is some kind of uh, economic scandal. And uh, yesterday there was a big uh, debate in the Greek parliament concerning this issue. Uh, I cannot comment uh, the issue of uh, the economic scandal. I'm not a specialist mm. to do that. However, I, I would like to comment on another aspect of this uh, sale of uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia, which is the main reason that Amnesty International has published uh, a press release and asking from the G Greek government to halt uh, the sale of these weapons. And this is the main aspect uh, from our side of view. It's uh, the fact that these weapons uh, may be used uh, from uh, the coalition led by Saudi Arabia uh, in uh, airstrikes or in, uh, or in Yemen. And this is for us something very important and for this reason we are asking from the Greek government uh, not to proceed in the sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia and actually respect the fact that uh, this very specific government itself has already ratified the Arms uh, Trade Treaty in 2016, in March uh, 2016, uh, which actually demands, requires from uh, the governments to uh, contact an assessment of uh, whether the sale of, the se the se the se the sale of weapons mm -hmm. in particular countries may be used in order to violate international humanitarian law, law and uh, human rights. Before we get uh, into more of the ethics of it, Peter, I just want to put to you this question about Greece's surplus weapons that it's trying to get rid of. It seems quite a strange scenario. Can you explain a little bit more about the situation there? Well, it seems that uh, Greece has uh, in the past acquired a substantial amount uh, of ammunition for its tanks. Uh, luckily, they have never used that. But of course, these, uh, this kind of ammunition has a best before date. Uh, at a certain point, it's not as effective or it may actually not work at all anymore. Um, so that date is now approaching and clearly Greece wants to get rid of these uh, of this type of ammunition. And somehow they have uh, clearly then marketed this internationally, looked around if there was a client, and it appears that Saudi Arabia has turned up to uh, to, to be interested in this kind of we we weapons. Now, that in itself is somewhat odd because um, Saudi Arabia is a country which spends a, a very large amount of money on its uh, military territory. Mm. And usually they buy the, the most 
the newest equipment. Um, this time they have uh, seemed to have looked for, uh, let's say, cheaper weapons. And we also know that they have done the same in neighboring countries, neighboring to Greece, like Bulgaria or Serbia. And that raises a number of questions why Saudi Arabia would want to buy this kind of uh, weapons or ammunition uh, at this point in time. Oh, can we look at that? Can we speculate as to why Saudi might be buying this ammunition that's very, very close to its expiry date and relatively small in number? Yeah, I think the two op options. One is that Saudi Arabia um, really feels it needs to quickly replenish its stocks of ammunition. It has used ammunition in Yemen uh, and maybe it, it needs to just replenish that and be able to use it. Mm. The other option, however, seems to be, and this has particularly been also discussed when uh, there were similar kind of deals with countries like Serbia, Bulgaria, that the weapons which are being acquired by Saudi Arabia, um, the cheap ones, the cheap uh, that are older ones, um, are potentially for actually giving away to, for example, the government in Yemen uh, under control of uh, Hadi, or, or maybe to, for example, that has also been suggested, to rebels in Syria. So there are lots of questions about that. It doesn't really seem to make complete sense that a rich, wealthy country like Saudi Arabia would need this old second-hand ammunition for itself. Andrew, you um, will be very familiar with Gabriel's argument there in Greece, given the UK's very prolific sale of weapons and ammunition to Saudi Arabia. Are you somewhat surprised to see Greece getting in on the action here? I'm certainly not surprised by the opposition we have seen, because I think mm. that's part of a much bigger picture around the world, where there has been far stronger political opposition to arms sales to Saudi Arabia, whether that's been in the UK, whether it's been in Germany, Canada or the US, or now in Greece. So I'm not surprised by the scale of opposition to it at all. In terms of the Greek government's position on it, um, I, I expect that the Greek government is trying to increase the arms exports it's making and part of that will be about building the arms trade and getting a larger slice of it for Greece and for Greek industry. However, the Greek government is one which does talk about the importance of human rights and democracy mm. quite regularly and yet it is arming and supporting one of the most brutal regimes in the world which does not believe in human rights, does not believe in democracy and has waged a brutal bombardment against the people of Yemen for almost three years now. It has created one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. UK arms have been central to that, US arms have been central to that and now it looks like the Greek government is wanting to arm and support the exact same terrible devastating bombing campaign. Uh, Gabriel, you were formerly a spokesman for Prime Minister Tsipras. Could you perhaps give us some insight into why he's doing this? He's the leader of a very leftist party. Is he happy selling arms to Saudi Arabia? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I, the main reason that, as it seems, the Greek government wants to sell these uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia are mostly as it seems, as it is claimed actually from the side of the Greek government, is mostly economic reasons. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Greece, as you may know, <laughs> of course, it's in an economic uh, crisis, a prolonged economic crisis, and there is a, a lack of economic resources. So in, uh, take, uh, in, th in this way, uh, the Greek government believes that uh, it can sell some uh, weapons that cannot be used, uh, for, uh, that the Greek army does, doesn't want to use them. And uh, in this way they can sell them uh, to another country and uh, make some money out of it. Uh, in, our, in our point of view as Amnesty International, this argument is uh, not an appropriate one because you cannot uh, put, uh, you cannot uh, uh, compare uh, the economic factors with uh, human lives and uh, violations of international humanitarian law. Andrew, the argument in the UK is also an economic one, isn't it? I mean, there's a huge amount of money to be gained from these arms deals with Saudi Arabia. Well, certainly without war and conflict, there wouldn't be an arms industry. Um, if world peace broke out tomorrow, mm. the arms industry would probably be one of the first to go bankrupt. So there is a lot of money involved in it. And to the arms companies which are fueling the devastating bombing we're seeing in Yemen, 
Um, that is not a humanitarian crisis to them. To them, it's a business opportunity. Mm. So there certainly is money to be made in it. However, we have to put this in wider context. Looking at the UK, for example, the arms industry accounts for roughly about 0.2% of jobs in the economy. So although there is a lot of money to be made for the arms companies, it's actually a very small sector of the economy. It's a very small sector of the economy which employs some incredibly skilled people. We want to see their skills being put to good use in other industries, in more productive industries, such as green technology, such as other areas of engineering. We want to see that happen in the UK and we want to see that happen in Greece. But it would seem that uh, many people in the UK, not least the judiciary, won't, doesn't agree with you. And indeed, the UK High Court ruled just five months ago in favour of these arms sales. Well, we are, in the, we are in the process of appealing that verdict. We believe that if that verdict is upheld, then it will be regarded by, green, regarded by government as a green light to continue arming and supporting some of the most brutal, repressive regimes in the world and to continue fueling human rights abuses around the world. However, people who we do know that the UK public agrees with us because poll after poll has shown that the overwhelming majority of people in the UK oppose arms exports, not just to Saudi Arabia, but to other human rights abusing regimes. In fact, the most recent poll I saw, which was done last month by Opinion, found that only 9% of the public think it's acceptable to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. And yet, despite that, despite the overwhelming public opposition, the UK has sold $5 billion worth of arms to the Saudi regime since it began its mm. brutal bombardment of Yemen. We want the UK government to stand up for human rights, to stand up for democracy and to end its toxic relationship with the Saudi regime. We want to see the UK make that change and we want to see other governments make that change too. Gabriel, are the Greek public against this deal? Because it does seem in Greece, especially the political debate, it's centred more on the use of this alleged middleman rather than the actual human, alleged human rights or potential human rights abuses that come with the deal. I believe that uh, the, the, the public opinion in Greece, first of all, uh, has now been aware, uh, slowly but uh, gradually, been aware, being aware of what is happening in Yemen. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, it, it's very important uh, for us. Uh, even from this uh, discussion about uh, the economic scandal, uh, people in Greece uh, realized what is happening now in Yemen. Uh, for me, the very... Uh, an optimistic scenario actually is that uh, before a while, actually one hour ago, uh, there, is a, there was a, uh, from the side of the Parliamentary Committee for mm -hmm. on Armament program, Programs and uh, Contracts, uh, there was a new uh, meeting of this committee uh, planned for next week, I think. Uh, about uh, this issue uh, with the question of halting the sale, the sa the sale of uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. And this happened after the pressure uh, that uh, human rights organizations in Greece and Amnesty International in Greece uh, exercised uh, to the members of the Greek parliament okay. and also to, uh, on account of the fact that the Greek public opinion is against this uh, sale of uh, weapons. Peter, do we have any evidence that Saudi actually uses these foreign-bought weapons or arms in Yemen? Um, Saudi Arabia, together with some other countries in the region, um, has started a full-out military intervention uh, in Yemen. Um, that involves the use of all types of arms, ranging from combat aircraft that uh, do bombing missions to uh, forces on the ground to ships that uh, uh, create a blockade uh, towards Yemen. Um, so it is the full spectrum of weapons which is being employed. Uh, exactly which weapons are being used, whether those Greek weapons, if they would reach Saudi Arabia, would be used in Yemen, we would not be sure. Um, maybe at a certain point some evidence would come out. But there have been several groups, both NGOs and also United Nations panel of experts, who have persistently said that there are very clear indications, there's clear proof that the Saudi armed forces have used violence in Yemen, which is no longer in line with international law, international humanitarian law, uh, the, the law of war. They have um, attacked uh, civilian targets uh, to the extent that it can no longer be explained as an accident or something which they hadn't foreseen. It seems that either they are doing this on purpose 
or they are um, negligent and they have uh, a used force uh, in a way that, that cannot be accepted. That is widely uh, uh, Said. The problem is, however, that there is no, let's say, international governmental body, mm. no international court which has actually, uh, let's say, proven this um, in a more official way. Okay, yes, and we will get onto that in just a moment. But first, Saudi Arabia is not alone in seeking arms from seemingly unconnected nations. Israel hasn't divulged details of its ties to Myanmar's government, but Israeli patrol boats, guns and surveillance equipment were sold during the violent crackdown against the Rohingya minority. A UN investigation revealed the Egyptian government broke an international arms embargo on North Korea. A North Korean ship was found to be carrying 30,000 rocket-propelled grenades off the coast of Egypt. And Amnesty International revealed how a shell company registered in London sold at least $46 million worth of arms to the South Sudanese government in 2014. Andrew Peter was just talking there about a framework to regulate the arms trade. We do have the arms trade treaty. That is supposed to stop arms from going to repressive regimes. How's that working out? Well, I think one of the problems of the Arms Trade Treaty is that it's actually a very weak piece of legislation. It does have a lot of loopholes in it, and none of the governments who have been promoting it, which does include some of the largest arms exporting nations of the world, none of them regard it as a curb on their ability to sell weapons. They all view it as legitimising the sales which they're already doing. So I think the Arms Trade Treaty certainly needs work done to it. We want it to succeed. But I don't think the problem is primarily a legislative one, because we believe that in the UK, when the UK is selling arms to Saudi Arabia, we believe it is in violation of UK arms export criteria. We don't believe the problem is legislative. It's about political will. It's about the fact that government after government of all political colours have been more than happy to put arms exports and arms company profits ahead of human rights mm. and ahead of democracy. So we want to see a cultural change. As, uh, we want to see a cultural change. We do want to see stronger legislation internationally, but we also want government to actually abide by the legislation that's already in place, to not just follow the letter of it, but also the spirit of it. Because there's absolutely no moral defence for these arms exports whatsoever. But Gabriel, doesn't the case in Greece prove uh, Andrew's point exactly, that there's very little political will to abide by these regulations? because Greece signed this arms trade treaty just last year. Yes, of course. Uh, the Greek government actually rectified, as I, I think I've, I've already mentioned, has ratified the arms trade treaty in uh, March uh, 30th of uh, uh, 2016. It's actually one year and a half ago. And it was this, the, same the same government that is today in power. So actually... Uh, the problem is that, uh, of course, these treaties uh, are not, uh, uh, do not uh, entail any sanctions for the countries mm. that violate uh, the treaties. But, uh, of course, uh, from the moment that uh, a government, a country, uh, signs and uh, ratifies the treaty, then it has to respect what is uh, included in the treaty. And we believe that uh, no, no, no assessment has been done from the side of the Greek government of the, the, the risks that such a sale of uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia right. and how these uh, weapons can be used in Yemen uh, has been uh, conducted. And this is a very big problem, actually, and at least it should be done a, a risk assessment. Peter, that brings me on to the EU Parliament. It's going to be debating an arms embargo, isn't it? I mean, one does exist that's non-binding. We've seen how well that goes. Will this new one potentially have more teeth? Uh, no, there is uh, very little chance that uh, whatever the EU may suggest and already has suggested when it comes to an EU arms embargo, that, that will actually lead to an agreement between the EU states um, to impose uh, an arms embargo or even, let's say, significant restraints on arms exports to Saudi Arabia. I find it very difficult to believe that in the light of uh, what countries like France and the UK in particular, but also many others within the EU have done over the years, uh, the fact that they know so well what's going on in Saudi Arabia, that uh, this, uh, this resolution, which 
probably will be voted upon uh, within the European Parliament on Thursday will actually then uh, the the resolution may come true, but then uh, the EU Council would not follow up on it as they have not done uh, last year either. So I think that there's very little reason to believe that uh, we will see much change in the arms flows uh, from EU countries to Saudi Arabia, um, with maybe a few exceptions there. Andrew, why is it? I, mean, I get the economic argument, but there is growing evidence that we cannot keep arming Saudi because of the war in Yemen. And yet countries, more countries, let's look at Greece today, are coming on board to provide arms. Why is that? Well, Saudi Arabia has always carried a totally disproportionate voice in the corridors of power in the UK, and I expect that is the same internationally as well. This is a regime which does put an awful lot of time and effort into lobbying other governments and does put an awful lot of time and effort into trying to build relationships and uh, increase its influence, no question of it. Um, but ultimately, I think that economics is going to be a driving point for a lot of these mm -hmm. governments. And that is irrespective of the devastating humanitarian consequences. And they have been truly devastating. There will be people dying of cholera even during this broadcast. The um, death toll we're seeing from Yemen is increasing every day. And the situation is only getting worse. And yet, to the arms dealers, as I said, this is regarded as a business opportunity. We sincerely hope that Greece does not follow in the footsteps of the UK and other governments which have provided an uncritical political and military support to Saudi Arabia. And not just in this conflict, but for decades and decades. Uh, Gabriel, do you think this uh, deal will go ahead? Uh, from our side, from Amnesty International side in Greece, uh, we will continue extra, uh, uh, pressing the Greek government to halt uh, the sale of uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are optimistic that uh, this pressure will eventually uh, end up in a positive result and uh, that uh, the human rights conditions in Yemen will be taken into consideration from the side of the Greek government. And uh, as I told you before a little while, in, next, uh, in a few days there will be a discussion in mm. the parliamentary group that discusses the, 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 these topics. So we are uh, optimistic that we will have a positive result. From our side, we will continue our campaign in Greece and we will be coordinated with uh, other Amnesty International sections around the world in order to have a positive result, a positive result in Greece. Peter, just finally, even if the US and the EU are banned, if there is an arms embargo that countries abide by, countries like Saudi Arabia are going to seek weapons anywhere, aren't there? And there will always be a provider. So at the end of the day, does it matter? Um, of course, it matters. Even if Saudi Arabia could turn to China or to Russia or to a whole range of other states to acquire arms if they can't get them from either the EU or from, 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 from the US, mm -hmm. just having an arms embargo is a very, very strong signal to any country that their military or political uh, position is not accepted, that what they do is no longer seen as acceptable for those states which impose the embargo. So it's a clear signal. It won't bring an end to a conflict, uh, but it is part of a larger process. And I think it's an important part. Andrew, do you ever see the UK changing its stance and preventing weapons from reaching these repressive areas? We certainly hope so, and we hope that when our case goes to appeal, we hope that it does set a vital precedent and does end the toxic military relationship between the UK and Saudi Arabia, and that the UK can use its position um, internationally to call for human rights and democracy and meaningful change in Saudi Arabia and, and end to the devastating conflict in Yemen. We want to see that change. We believe people in the UK want to see that change. And we believe people in Saudi Arabia and Yemen want to see mm. that change. OK, there we will leave our very interesting discussion today. Thank you all for joining us. Gabriel Sekalaregis, Andrew Smith and Peter Weisman. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, bye for now.